Good afternoon. So I'm trying to introduce you to a new and very exciting field of research. It's called organoid chips. And I want to try to talk a bit how can we apply this technology for precision medicine. Let's start first, what are organoid chips? And here's a wonderful illustration that means nothing. We are not even close to it. So basically what we accomplish is to connect, interconnect in a physiological manner, multiple mini organs from a human being together with the circular system to try to understand how the tissues work with each other, where does toxicology makes its first impact, and how can we re replicate human physiology. In fact, what we are trying to do is not that at all. We are trying to create a system that houses three-dimensional human tissue cultures in a dynamic microchip environment under controlled condition. Because if you can control it, then you have the, these things that are so important to the industry and they sound so boring. It's standardization, harmonization, reproducibility, and stability of your system. And if you have that, you can actually start trying to do what you cannot do in an animal. You can try to manipulate your tissues in a way that you can do in biology. You can turn off the oxygen for 20 minutes. You can put shear forces on there, much more that the biology can actually handle, and see how does the biology react under different conditions. Of course, you can also do toxicology studies and seeing, try and understand these biological processes. And for that, you need a lot of technology because now we have to support human functions, those functions that the human body usually does. That means if you hear in a newspaper about a wonderful organ on the chip or the chip-based disease models we talk, say today is then you need to look for a couple of, uh, of very important features. And one of the features is you need the multicellular architecture. It needs to resemble that in nature. You need to know a lot of your biology you work you're working in there. You also have to have a functional representation of your tissues using the right cells. The cells have to do what they're actually supposed to do in the human body in health in the disease state. You also need, and that's very important for us, a re reliable operation of the system for at least four weeks because you need homeostasis. You also need to be able to make the tissue sick and healthy again and back and forth to see and uh, decide how it responds. But of course, you need population diversity. And if any of these features are not there, and I dare challenge you looking at the three examples I'm presenting you, if all of this is in there or not. If you're talking about a format that this is the size of a Visa card, obviously we're not having organs on a chip. Basically what we are trying to sell you is we're having the smallest functional units of an organ on the chip. And here are the two best well-known organ chip system, the liver and the lung on the chip. And basically, if you look, and this is just a schematic, on the smallest functional unit of a liver, a liver nodule is 100,000. It's a huge, complex structure. I've never seen that in an organ on the chip. You know, you have, uh, uh, in, in, in addition, uh, the more complex architecture of the cells. You have immune cells in there. You have uh, arteries, veins, spinal conducts, and so forth. Even if you go to um, the lungs and the alveoli, with its biomechanics, the air-liquid interface, uh, the different cell culture layers of in the, the intricate network of the vasculature, we do not have that on chip. What we are trying to sell you as an organ, the chip, is we have a cell mass in a pocket, we are having uh, barriers, that there are two different cell types, you know, the epithelial and endothelial separated by a, a simple porous membrane, or we have a hydrophil-based uh, system where the cells starting to reorganize the biological niche. And despite the simplicity, what we are having now is actually a miniaturized functional unit of an organ. They're extremely powerful and they do work uh, precisely as we anticipate to do that. Here are a couple examples of a liver uh, system, our placenta. We have the placenta barrier underneath the blood vessel to the fetus underneath. Um, a, a structure with a lot of stem cells to see how can we design drugs that actually go to us, the cell city, to the membrane. We have a vasculature, so we have miniaturized blood vessels. They're super perfusible. They are completely functional. So the system do work. And just to give you a bit of a North American perspective for today's uh, speaker, I thought, let's look at the implementation of this organ the chip technology, which is around five years old. And if you look at it, we have uh, companies in the US they have single organs on the chip or multiple organs, they're doing drug screening to see what is the toxicology of these compounds. But what is more exciting, NASA realized early on, having a miniaturized system that doesn't weigh anything, it's ideal to actually send up to the uh, low, so to the space, 
to, in, to investigate low gravity or zero gravity impact on human tissues. We know that astronauts suffer from a, a range of different diseases when they come back from arthritis, muscle atrophy, degeneration of bone and so forth. So we're trying to understand how this system works by bringing organs on the chip up to the uh, ISS station in the low gravity. What is truly amazing is of course the American military and here the Air Force because it turns out that they have defined it as the organs on chip as a turnkey technology, which is fighter pilot proof. What turned out they were interested is, is having from the pilot a series of organs on the chip inside the fighter jets to see how the massive acceleration of the fighter jets, if they move and turn, has any impact of the organs they do not anticipate yet. And of course, because it's the US, it's a liability issue. Who is going to pay for them the damages in case 30, 40 years later, they do have serious tissue damage. Nevertheless, it shows how powerful it is. What I'm more interested is in how can we use it for clinical trials or to do clinical trials on chip. Currently, we know that we are using this organ chip to kind of replace animal testing. FDA has made great strides to that and agrees and uh, is fine with these measurements at the moment. But we want to go a step further, particularly in phase one, where we can say, well, we're actually in phase one trials, we're looking in, is the stuff toxic? We could do this on organ and chip, and perhaps in future, having a multitude of, of different organs that chip from a variety of um, subpopulations, Asians, European, young, old, male, female, to test is it really effective for these subpopulations as well. So the mission today is, as I said here, is, is to develop innovative methods and technology that enhance the development of these drugs for precision medicine. Obviously, I've already told you there are some advantages on the chip, but there are also a range of limitations. I want you to be really seriously aware of. Uh, we know that organ chip has been turned, uh, uh, termed uh, one of the top six emerging technologies because of its potential to transform precision medicine. We know now, thanks to the Nobel Press, and, uh, that we can turn skin cells into pluripotent stem cells. With the stem cells, we can actually generate mini organs that resemble the physics, uh, the physiological state and genetics of our patient, and we can work with these cell cultures under different conditions where we redefine the conditions. But in addition to the advantages, you know, the, the biomimic of a tissue architecture that we have a dynamic system in there that we can present a cell phenotype in vitro over long periods of time, we do have an, a number of limitations. And the first and foremost limitation is basically we have an immune system in there. We do add immune cells, we can recruit immune cells, but usually they're not from the patient. So we have neither innate nor an adaptive immune system. The circulatory factors are hugely important in medicine. We also don't have a good solution to get the circulatory factors or an artificial blood surrogate from the patient into the chip to make sure all the different organ types we have in there can be supplied at the same time. So we're still dealing with artificial biomaterials, um, gas gradients, and biomechanics. It's really hard. Our body is used to biomechanical stress on all levels, and it's really hard on a t in a single tissue to replicate these uh, mechanical stresses and so forth. We do have tissue-tissue interactions, but in some cases inadequate because the scaling laws are really hard. The tissues have different sizes, different uh, flow rates, and to pack it all on a chip platform and miniaturize, this is truly a challenge itself. So be aware of that. Uh, if, you, if you hear new reports how wonderful this device is, helps in medicine. Now I said a lot of cradle things about organs and the chip, which I shouldn't have, but if you ask me who needs organ and the chip, my honest answer is everyone needs it. But the truth is we do have a lot of potential stakeholders from patient group, medical centers, advocacy group, pharmaceutical sciences, of course, and more and more regulatory agencies who demand this kind of technology. The potential applications, and I think I'm a bit conservative here, is the best application is to understand the mechanistic insights, where you change a parameter in the microarray and you try to understand why the biology reacts the way it, under, it reacts and how can we get from a diseased phenotype to unhealthy. What I'm more interested in in my line of work is uh, personalized medicine and associated with that, of course, can we reduce animal testing to understand biological material interactions on the micro scale. 
So for me, the application of organship and precision medicine builds on the, the, the generic understanding what is precision medicine. Precision medicine is uh, understanding the genomic profile of a patient and predicting from the genomics how would the patient react to the drug and what uh, kind of concentration should I use for the drug. This is more in my view a population medicine approach. Now in our, my case I want to say let's use the cells of the patients and uh, initiate a preventative measurement before the disease actually starts because we can make this tissue sick and we can make it healthy and we can understand under what conditions would you get the disease and what are the best medication therapies to actually alleviate the disease. Or if you're already diseased, we'll take the diseased tissue and see what is the best therapy uh, over time. That means we're having a diverse population group, so we take direct patient samples, so IPC derived samples, so we throw it on the chip, we develop the organs on the chip in different kind of organs the patient derived. We do the drug testing and so say what kind of dose, what kind of concentration would be ideally suited, and usually this is not enough. So the other approach is now getting more into more into um, companion diagnostic, that we also develop lab on the chip devices that continue monitor what kind of biomarkers are coming up, is there any changes, feeding that back via near-field communication devices, wireless data transfer to the physicians who actually adjust the therapy on the fly over many, many months ahead. So these are the approaches we're trying to envision. Now I want to give you three quick examples how we think or where we saw that there is a need or at least the application for organ on the chip. The one is, of course, cancer on the chip. Cancer is, of course, a big issue. And uh, for that, we, we started looking into papers using organoids, cancer spheroids, and cancer tissues in vitro. And what we realized that you cannot compare one result to the other because there's one thing that always is different if you grow tissues in vitro, the maturity of the tissue and the size of the tissue. And size and maturity does matter a lot if you do pharmacokinetic studies on these uh, kind of uh, uh, systems. So we thought we need to start harmonizing, standardizing the technology. For us, it's a, it's a very beautiful engineering approach where we have four organ the chip devices in parallel. Every chip has around uh, six chambers. Every chamber has 15 uh, spheroids you can make. Every uh, from the 15 spheroids, we have five different sizes because we're interested how do the, the, the tumor growth interacts and interferes with the, with the drug efficacy. And in total, if you have that, you can make 360 experiments in one set. If you stack it, you go, you're up to around 3,000 experiments on one, one kind of approach. The idea of having different sizes of tumor growth is nice. It's not as simple as it looks like. You want to have ideal spheroids, so they need to sit right in the middle of the location. They need to be linearly spaced and you can actually get a relationship out of it. You have to uh, supply nutrients to them, remove the waste, uh, waste products and so forth. So that's the technology we, we invented and actually patented uh, and licensed to a Bay Area company to try to make this kind of uh, approaches. And then we thought we need a practical application to see that it's really useful to have tumor growth on the different sizes, microtumors to millimeter sized tumors. And so we, we reached out to the cell bank, uh, to the medical university in Graz. They gave us from a, a lung cancer patient tumor cells. And uh, we also asked what, what kind of medication, the treatment, the chemotherapy treatment was on the one hand cisplatin. Here you can see it's a cell division blocker that if we increase the concentration, the bigger the tumor gets, the less effective the drug is. And that the highest size was around uh, uh, one, so one millimeter, only 50% of the outer tumor was killed and the inner survived. So in the second drug they usually give in this combinatorial uh, uh, approach it was toxirubicin. It's, it's a nasty one, it kills everything even in low concentration. And the idea was, can we find a combination of this drug and what kind of ratio actually kills the tumor of all sizes with the minimum amount of toxirubicin? So we did a combinal approach using this chip uh, technology, and we actually did find, and this is a very small heat map out of it from all the experiments we did, there's one concentration, one to 100, where you have 100 micromolar of uh, concentration of cisplatin, which is quite harmless for bigger sizes, as well as one micromolar of doxyrubicin, which is also quite harmless 
for uh, bigger sizes, but in combination, it would kill off any kind of size tumor you have. So this was a very strong approach to say, okay, now we can standardize, harmonize, and do larger sets of drug testing at the same time. The next example I want to give is, is, is where we used cells, primary cells from the patient. And this is always very hard for us. We usually you don't get a lot of uh, biopsies from the patients during the disease. So in, in our case, we just decided we need to move somewhere where there is not a lot of uh, um, drugs available to, to help uh, patients with arthritis because it's a deliberating disease, um, but it's not fatal at all. So what I was surprised is I only knew osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis that are actually more than 100 different versions out there. And uh, just looking now for today into the rheumatoid arthritis, it's an autoimmune disease. There's a high prevalence. It's very painful. And most of the time what we do is pain mediation, but we don't have really good treatments for that. So in order just to guide you through how you approach an organ chip, so we know the target tissues. This is our joints. We know that you need a bit of cartilage, you need of a, a, a space in between, and the synovial lining layer that provides all the nutrients and interacts with these tissues quite nicely. So how do you approach it? We know we cannot build the entire joint, we just need a representative functional lease between these two tissues. So this is how the chip design would look like, one chamber for the cartilage, one chamber for the synovium, nicely separated around the same uh, uh, aspect ratios what you have in the joints and the two chambers up and down, this is here actually to mimic movement because the only movement uh, of, uh, flow you have is through movement. And so we are shooting the fluids back and forth to give to both tissues, there's actually movement of the fingers and then they can start interacting. If you look more into the uh, cell biology of things, you clearly see the synovium lining layer. It's beautiful set up the way you expect it to be. Even in the cartilage, if you look in the histology, you see the round morphology of the chondrocytes. If you look at the stainings, they do produce exactly what they should produce, the cartilage uh, tissues. And if you compare it with the patient itself, you cannot distinguish anywhere which results came from the patient and which from the organ that chip in terms of gene expression. So they are that similar. For us, it was important to see that we can actually induce biochemically induce arthritis because they had a genetic background from the patient. And if you, if you induce uh, uh, biochemically with stimulating with cytokines, we clearly saw the two hallmarks of arthritis. The one is hyperplasia, so the thin lining layer starts getting thicker and thicker when they get a lot of proliferation in deeper cards. So we, so we knew we can actually make the tissue sick and healthy again. I said, now we have solved uh, humanity, at least uh, the clinical application of it. And we did, we designed the joint on the chip. We asked the hospital to donate 16 samples from patients they are having. Dark is now the cartilage, it's a denser structure. Here on, on, the, on the left side, the synovium from a patient. And you can already see physically, if you look through the microscope, the image, it's quite different than from a healthy, uh, healthy synovium. And the reason why it looks so granulated is because you have tons of immune cells in there and a high amount of interleukin-6. You can actually measure that. So we thought, okay, uh, we want to know a bit more. And if you do a cell count, you can actually see that over 20% of the tissue cells are now immune cells, and they have different ratios of B cells, T cells, macrophages. And then based on that experiment, we suggested for the patient population group, they all have similar symptoms, same genetic background, uh, to actually add our six blocker and beta cell inhibitor. And it turns out, that this therapy would have only worked for one patient, one patient only. And if you looked a bit closer, we saw that the other patients had almost no amount, a uh, very low amount of immune cells. Some didn't have B cells at all. So the immunological status and immune cells are hugely important in this line of work. So this is for us a very great argument why you should go to a personalized uh, approach if you have immune cells present. The next part, and for my, for my side, the last example for the day is the midbrainal chip blood form. Uh, developing a multisensory integrated microfluidics to assess actually the onset of neurodegenerative diseases and uh, for not only follow it, but can we actually test drugs to alleviate that. And we picked Parkinson's because of a long lasting uh, collaboration that started 2014. And I just put it out the timeline here, 2014. Now it's 2023 and the chip works. That means a lot of patients, it was really hard. And one of the reasons what we underestimated is 
neurodegenerative processes are aging disease. It happens over many, many decades. Now we are getting from, from Parkinson patients skin samples which we reprogram in adult stem cells, and the stem cell is by definition a young cell. And it was not clear why these organoids never got sick the way we anticipated. Um, maybe a bit of background to Parkinson's. Uh, it's, it's over a million people are affected. The, the target tissue is the substantia nigra, the midbrain. It's called substantia nigra because of the neuromelanin formation. And in a Parkinson patient, you actually see two things. The dopaminergic neuron count goes down, they die. And the second thing you see over time is the accumulation of this alpha synuclein, also the Lucy Lewis bodies. And these are the two hallmarks that actually followed up with motor symptoms and also what a lot of people underestimate, uh, non-motor symptoms, depression, hallucination, and so forth. Um, so the way it works, we're getting skin samples from a patient cohort from Luxembourg. We reprogram in the lineage to, to only get them towards uh, committing them towards a midbrain specific uh, lineage. After 10 days, quite early actually, we get them into our uh, the microfluidic lab on the chip. And in there, they start to mature and they need 60 days. And when we start seeing dark spots after 60 days on chip, you do see that, okay, neuromelanin has been uh, produced and we can start doing this kind of experiments. For me, most important is these characteristics uh, height, pillars, chamber ratios, because that defines the biological niche. If it's too small, the neurons like to spread out. If it's too big, they're behaving quite differently. It's very hard to actually standardize it then. So it took us a long time to optimize that. And uh, what you can see here is that once you have it in, within a couple of days to start to grow, the neuron, neurons are starting to grow out and they're doing what it's supposed to do. And then still it never worked. And there was a little change with it by accident and turned this research upside down. And it's called the brain-specific uh, circadian rhythm of the interstitial flow, which we were not aware of. So the interstitial flow in the brain is quite small, but it turns out overnight we have a higher flow in the brain to remove substance than during the day. And once we started implementing this flow regime uh, constantly over 30 days, we saw things happening uh, on a very different scale. First of all, it was important to have a unidirectional flow. It always goes from the artery to the vein through a very narrow space. What we saw first is that the neurons starting aligning to the flow as we could target them. If you can align them, you can actually put electrodes underneath and you can start measuring uh, the physiological activity. So we were so starting to see that this neuron is starting firing. You can actually uh, zoom in into the actual action potential. You have monophasic, biphasic, or aspects. You actually can get different kind of signal from different cells indicating there are more than just the one neuron type in there. There are multiple neuron types in there during this maturation process. Here's a, uh, a nice image of a beautiful, healthy midbrain uh, on a chip where you can see the cell mass. The different colors are just that green and normal neurons. Magenta is uh, specifically stained for uh, dopaminergic neurons, and we also have astrocytes. So we know we have different kind of neurons, and it's going to get in a more natural state. If we cultivate now, a midbrain from a patient, these patients are the hardest. They, are, they have a triple mutation, the alpha succinoin gene, they all get Parkinson's. So this was the reason why we, we use this, because these are the population group, it's so the patient group that really needs medication the, and the most urgent. And you already can see it, it's a very different uh, uh, how they look like they develop. Uh, they are smaller, compacted, the neurot outgrowth is not as nice, and so forth. But we did not know at that point, can we actually see Parkinson's, and again, it's the, the dopaminergic nerves that are dying out, and we need to see Lewy bodies in there, the accumulation of this uh, misaggregation of alpha succinonuclein. And after a couple of months, we're starting realizing it's actually happening. You can stain for that. And the more we looked into it, we, we saw the upcoming of these Lewy bodies inside the cells. So at this point, it was clear that uh, we do see the first hallmark, um, we should just rotate to make sure that uh, it's actually inside or not outside. And the second, we started to integrate sensors to see the dopaminergic, uh, is dopamine reduced in there or not? 
And if you did that, you clearly see in those uh, uh, organoids that came from patients with trivial mutation, the dopamine production went down and we could really directly link it to the number of, uh, or the, the loss of the monergic neurons. So we had the two hallmarks and we were super happy about that. And now so what? Because we thought now we have to do some drug screening to show that it works. Turns out there are no drugs out there for Parkinson's to treat. And those companies who have the drugs in the pipeline were less than willing to give us their drugs to publish it. So we did the next best thing. We looked around and said, okay, we can generate isogenic pairs, you know, through gene deletion or correction. So on the one hand, we used the healthy ones, we inserted the gene, the alpha, the, the triple, with the mutation, with the, uh, the triple mutation on, from the patients, we deleted it with CRISPR-Cas and see how is it actually happening. In here, case, uh, we, we did oxygen sensing because the, metabol the, metabol the metabolic uh, capacity changes dramatically if it's sick or not. And you can actually see the difference between a healthy and a deceased organoid. And if you actually do a gene corrections, the metabolism, so the activity of the mitochondria goes up significantly. Did not change much on the dopamine, but you can see there was an improvement doing gene correction. But it also clearly states gene correction is not enough. This is a multifactorial disease where around 15 genes are associated and 25 are actually uh, kind of linked to that. So most of them, we don't know why they get Parkinson's. So gene correction is not sufficient. So we tried to do our best and we, we did find uh, one compound. It's a beta cyclodextrin that actually crosses very nicely the blood brain barrier and has been published that it actually uh, induces autography and, and alleviates and helps Parkinson's in organoids. Um, we did the same here to see the, the, the clouds, see how many patient samples we got. Every point is a patient. And you see the distributions between the different patients also indicating this is a personalized approach. But if you look at when we, we, we got this repurposed drug in there, that a sm only a small cohort from the patients improved significantly and the rest not. But at least for the first time, we can demonstrate that using this technology, you can actually see what kind of drug works, how does it work, and for which population and, and uh, patient it will work. With this, I'm already at the end of my 18 minutes towards the target uh, presentation, and uh, just here some greetings of my research group. Thank you so much for your attention.